Is Betelgeuse a binary star? Starliner is coming home empty. New Glenn is on schedule to launch NASA's next mission to Mars and NASA's solar sail unfurls. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. In 2019, we got a dramatic demonstration that Betelgeuse is a variable star. It can dim and brighten over a fairly set schedule, but you know, sometimes it will go exceedingly dim. So the more familiar cycle takes about 400 days, but there's a second cycle that takes about 2170 days. And this is how long it takes Betelgeuse to brighten and dim over this longer period. And astronomers weren't entirely sure why it had this second longer cycle that was so regular. And now a new paper proposes that in fact, this is because Betelgeuse is actually a binary star that there is a second star that is orbiting around Betelgeuse at a distance so that it takes 2170 days to go once around the orbit. And if you do the math, that is about 2.43 times the radius of Betelgeuse and Betelgeuse already would engulf the orbit of Jupiter in the solar system. So this star with about one times the mass of the sun is orbiting pretty closely to the surface of the star comparatively speaking. And so as this star is going around Betelgeuse, it is siphoning up and disturbing all of the dust. We know the Betelgeuse because it's going through this, this variation, it's expanding, contracting, changing, puffing out a lot of dust. And then the star is passing through this dust, mixing it up, concentrating it. And that's what's causing this additional variation in the brightness of the star. So there's no direct observation of this second star, but it would explain this very long period that we see with the changes in Betelgeuse's brightness. Can you imagine the like the sun orbiting around Betelgeuse? It'd be so bizarre. The Starliner crew is coming home on a crew dragon. NASA finally made the call. Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams are going to be coming home on a crew dragon spacecraft. And this is after they launched on a Starliner back in June. And the expectation was that they would only stay on the International Space Station for a week. And yet here we are almost in September, they're still on the station. NASA is continuing to evaluate the safety, their concerns with the helium leaks on the Starliner, the thruster problems. And over the weekend, NASA finally made the call that they're gonna bring Starliner home empty. They're going to be detaching Starliner on September 6th. And that gives time for the next Crew Dragon that's going to be launching with the next expedition to the International Space Station to be able to dock. And so the plan now is that Wilmore and Williams will become officially part of Expedition 7172. They'll stay on board the International Space Station until February. And then they're going to come back with the crew that went up on the most recent Crew Dragon. One challenge is that they don't have spacesuits. If you're riding on a Crew Dragon, you need a specially built spacesuit that fits with the Crew Dragon, attaches with umbilicals to the various services on Crew Dragon. And so they're going to need to have their own suits brought up to the station. And so it's funny, people ask me, like, is this a problem? And obviously, it's a problem for Boeing. Uh, it's a bit of a problem for NASA. But for the astronauts, I'm sure this is pretty cool. I mean, they're astronauts, they want to be in space, they've trained for decades to be able to fly in orbit and to turn a one week trip, which is way too short into a six month trip. That sounds about right. I'm sure they're pretty happy. New Glenn is still on schedule. So a couple of weeks ago, we reported that there were some problems with the upper stage of New Glenn, and we sort of speculated on whether this would be a problem for the upcoming escapade mission for NASA. But I just got a media invite invitation from NASA, which means that uh, they are opening up for journalists to come down to the Cape to be able to watch the launch of the escapade mission to Mars on board a New Glenn rocket. And the date is set for October 13th, which is just a little over a month away. Now I can't attend the launch because 
I live on Vancouver Island and it's in Florida and that's very expensive. But that shows a pretty high level of confidence from NASA that they're still going ahead with the launch of Escapade. They're going to do all their part of the project. And so if all goes well, Escapade will launch on New Glenn, the first mission to launch on New Glenn on October 13th. And then it's going to send two twin spacecraft to go into orbit around Mars, and they're going to measure the impact of the solar wind as it interacts with the very faint magnetosphere around Mars. Like one of the big questions was, like, how did Mars lose its atmosphere a long time ago? Does it have any magnetosphere left? And what kind of ongoing processes are happening as the solar wind is interacting with Mars? And so these spacecraft will try to answer that question. There isn't a lot of leeway here that the launch window for Mars comes up every two years, and you've got to get your spacecraft into space in that launch window. And if you fail to meet that launch window, then you have to wait two years. We saw this with the Rosalind Franklin Rover. And so if there's any problems beyond several weeks, then the escapade mission is going to have to slip to 2026. And that is not something that NASA wants to happen. So hopefully, we will see both a really cool launch to Mars as well as the first launch of the new Glenn rocket. And then another mission that we've been tracking, which has sort of some uncertainty involved is the Europa Clipper mission. And this is an extremely exciting mission. Europa is one of Jupiter's moons, and it is one of the most interesting places in the solar system for the search for life. You've got this icy moon that has this thick shell of ice, tens of kilometers thick, surrounding a very large subsurface ocean of liquid water. Here on Earth, wherever we find liquid water, we find life. And so if there's liquid water on Europa, maybe there could be life there as well. And so the Europa Clippers mission is going to scan both the surface of Europa, as well as use a ground penetrating radar to be able to try and measure the depth of the ice, try and find pockets of water inside the ice. It's a very dangerous environment around Jupiter. Jupiter has all of this trapped radiation. You, you're probably familiar with the Van Allen belts here around the Earth, which is trapped radiation from the sun. Well, Jupiter has that, but like on steroids. And so any spacecraft that is passing through this radiation belt is going to take a dose of radiation. And so the plan for Europa Clipper is instead of just going into orbit around Europa, we'll have to remain in this heavy radiation environment. It's going to make these big, long flybys where it stays out safe, sends home data, thinks carefully, and then takes the plunge, dives in, does a quick flyby of Europa, coming within a couple of hundred kilometers of the surface of Europa, flies back out, collects its thoughts, <laughs> shakes off the radiation, and then does it all again. And it's that radiation that is a concern because a couple of months ago, NASA was looking through all the parts of Europa Clipper and they found that some of its transistors might not be as radiation hardened as they were hoping for. And so this has caused a new investigation and NASA is looking to the problem. And yet, we just got an announcement that Europa Clipper is still planning to launch on October 10th. And as part of this process, they just got their solar wings installed. Now these solar wings, these are the largest solar wings that have ever been installed on a planetary mission. They are the length of a basketball court. So more than 30 meters long, which is 100 feet. For those of you who always say I never use Imperial 100 feet, 30 meters. And you need to have solar panels this big because you are so far away from the sun. Jupiter is five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And you follow the inverse square law, Jupiter receives 1 25th the sunlight that the Earth does. And so if you want the same amount of solar power that you would get well, if you were at the Earth, then you need solar panels that are 25 times as big. And yet with these gigantic solar panels, they have to fit inside the Falcon Heavy payload fairing for launch. So still a lot of unknowns, concerns, and yet a very exciting mission. I can't wait. October 10th, solar sail spreads its wings. Do you remember the advanced composite solar sail system? This was a mission that launched back in April, a CubeSat mission on Electron rocket. And then we didn't hear a lot from it. Well, it turns out they were sort of doing a bunch of testing. And finally, this week, they tried to deploy the solar sails on this mission. On August 27th, we got a report from NASA that they were seeing higher voltages than expected on the motors designed to extend the booms of the solar sail. 
And what that means is that the booms are having trouble extending and then the motors are running too hard and they're running higher voltage. And that's a concern. But on August 29th, we got a report that the sail was unfurled and deployed. The mission is called ACS-3, and it is really just a technology demonstration. Can you use a solar sail to navigate in space? With the solar sails completely unfurled, it is seven meters across, and it's flying at an altitude around the Earth that is higher than the International Space Station. And so now it's going to use just the light of the sun to be able to raise its orbit, lower its orbit, change its orientation and try to see how much maneuvering they can do with just the power of the sun alone. And solar sails are a really exciting technology. We saw a demonstration from the Japanese with their Icarus mission. We saw the Planetary Society with their Light Sail 2 mission. We saw the failure of the Nia Scout mission, which was going to deploy from the Artemis 1. It was going to fly to an asteroid, which would have been really cool. So now we've got just like a really proper demonstration solar sail in orbit around Earth that we will learn a tremendous amount about how solar sails work as a form of propulsion. And with the ACS-3, it's a CubeSat mission. So you could imagine attaching one of these sort of solar sail packages to almost any mission. And then you've got this backup propulsion system. If all else fails, or if you need to just maneuver for a long period of time, you've got a solar sail. I love it. I can't wait to find out how well they do with this mission. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And this week the winner was the wow signal solved. So thank you everybody who voted. We post this vote onto our channel into the community tab within about 24 hours of when we post Space Bite. So if you're just scrolling on your phone or you're on your computer and you see the vote come up, go ahead, just take a second, tell us what you thought. Now, of course, if you never see this vote, that's because you're not watching enough of our videos. So the best thing to do is subscribe, click on the notifications bell, and then just really train the algorithm and watch a bunch of our videos. China reveals some of its plans for the moon. Now we got a couple of interesting reports coming from China about what they're planning to do with the moon, specifically the technologies they're thinking about testing out when they actually bring humans to the moon for their upcoming permanent station. The plan is for them to begin building the station in the 2030s, probably wrap up in the 2040s. And there's a bunch of things that they're going to need when they're on the moon. And primarily the one that everybody needs is water. Now we know that there is water both in the permanently shadowed craters at the South Pole of the moon, as well as just mixed in with the regolith. And it's probably that stuff that's in the regolith that's going to be more easy to access just because you can kind of pick it up from anywhere. But the problem is there's only about one liters worth of water in a cubic meter of regolith and you're gonna to have to process that. So a Chinese research report came out where they were talking about how they might extract water out of the lunar regolith to support their upcoming base. And the key is heat. They suggest you use concave mirrors to heat up the lunar regolith to 900 Celsius. And then from there, the iron crystallizes and the water that's trapped within the regolith then evaporates and comes out as bubbles of water that they can then collect and the superheated water escapes as steam. And then they can collect that and condense it and then use that for water for the base. They calculated that they can pull about 50 liters of water for every metric ton of regolith, which is enough to sustain 50 people on their station for a day, but then longer with recycling of the water. And then how do you get stuff home from the moon? And so another interesting technical report came out from China where they talked about putting an electromagnetic launcher on the surface of the moon. And this is not a new idea. I mean, people have been considering how you could put an electromagnetic launcher on the moon for decades, because on Earth, the size of the launcher, the energies required are enormous. But on the moon with one sixth gravity, it's a lot easier to hurl payloads into space off the surface of the moon. And so this paper suggests that they use something kind of similar to spin launch where you've got a 50 meter arm with the payload at the end, and then it spins up with electricity, which is produced from solar panels, and then releases its payload towards the Earth. And so what kinds of things would people want to send home from Earth? Now in this paper, they propose that they would send home helium three, which is theoretically going to be a much better kind of fuel for fusion reactors. 
On Earth, it's very rare. There's probably a million times as much helium three on the moon than there is on Earth, and like enough to provide fusion power for all of humanity for a 1000 years. You can imagine there's helium three mining happening on the moon, they're pulling together, concentrating the helium three putting it into capsules and then hurtling them off the moon back to Earth with this electromagnetic launcher. All right, as always, I like to wrap up with a couple of cool images and videos. So first, let's take a look at the star cluster NGC 346, which is located in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is another kind of mind bogglingly large star cluster. In fact, this one cluster contains about half of the super massive stars in the small Magellanic Cloud, which is a little farther away than the large Magellanic Cloud. And when you get stars that are much more massive, they shine primarily in the higher end of the spectrum. So they're shining in the blue and ultraviolet. And so one of the cool things about the Hubble Space Telescope is it can see from infrared through visible into the ultraviolet. And so when they look at this star cluster just in the ultraviolet, this highlights those supermassive stars. I like this because this is the opposite of James Webb, where it sees things in the infrared, it's seeing objects that are cool. While so it would show all of the, I don't know, the brown dwarfs in the cluster, while Hubble with its infrared view can see the really hot stars. And it shows that we need some kind of successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Once it goes offline, we're not going to have a telescope capable of doing this kind of work in the ultraviolet like Hubble can. And second, we got a video sequence that comes from ESA's juice mission. Now we talked about how it did a flyby of the moon and the Earth for the first time. And now they stitch together all of the images that were taken by this flyby. And so we've got this kind of movie. So it starts with seeing the moon with juice going past the moon and then seeing the moon in the rearview mirror, and then it looks towards the Earth and sees this crescent Earth. And then it flies past the Earth. And then we see the Earth in the rearview mirror. Now this isn't the only time the juice is going to be flying past the Earth, it's going to come back in 2026. And it's going to come back in 2029. So there's two more flybys that we're going to get. And there was this great idea from Carl Sagan that happened when the Galileo mission did a flyby of Earth, he asked himself, would the Galileo spacecraft detect that there was life on Earth, that Earth is a habitable planet. And so they did a bunch of images, took a bunch of data of the Earth as Galileo was flying by. And from that, they were able to confirm that yes, indeed, there is life on Earth. So they discovered life on Earth. And so hopefully the juice mission will also discover life on Earth. Now you are watching Space Bites. I am busy writing my weekly email newsletter. This is something that I send out to about 72,000 of my closest friends. It's completely free. I write every word in the newsletter and you can unsubscribe anytime you want. There's no ads. It's all good. Here's a couple of stories that we're working on that are in the newsletter, but not in Space Bites. For example, a low radiation path to Europa. How can astronauts avoid vision loss from spaceflight? And JAXA officially wraps up its slim lander mission. So go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. All right, I'm going to talk about the return of our live streams. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Robox, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chipelin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I'm recording this episode on Thursday, you're probably watching it on Friday, or maybe over the weekend. But the next big event that's going to happen on our channel is that on Monday, September 2nd, we return with our live streams. Now I know this is Labor Day. And it's one of those few holidays that is actually the same holiday in Canada and the US. And so theoretically, it's a holiday, but I think it's the perfect day to bring back the live streams. So on Monday at 5pm Pacific time, I will go live with the new season of the open space, which is the live recording of the question show. Now these shows are two hours long. So for the first hour, we will record the question show. And then for the second hour, we do what's called overtime and you hopefully watched a bunch of our overtime episodes over the summer. And so there's like an additional 40 hours ish that we record every season that nobody really sees, except for the people who are there live. And so if you want to come, 
Get your questions answered by me live in real time. Chat with the people in the community. I think you'll have a really good time. All right. Enjoy this show and we'll see you on Monday.